was in 1975, and it was a uh, Milwaukee County Stadium, and Walter Alston was the uh, manager. He put me in left field, of all places, uh, for the last inning, and I caught the last out of the game. Uh, Rod Carew uh, was the hitter. Randy Jones was the pitcher, and uh, he hit a slicing line drive to me in left field, and I still have that baseball, which I got signed by most of the guys. Hi, I'm Joe Morgan, and welcome to All-Star First. Over the course of the next half hour, you and I will examine a slew of All-Star debuts. For the most part, we'll focus in on those All-Stars whose first All-Star appearance was also their last. We'll also meet some of the game's perennial stars, and some of the new ones, like Eric Davis and Brett Saberhagen, who will be making their first All-Star appearance in 1987. For their sake, I hope it goes as well as mine did in 1970, when I got a hit in the ninth inning to keep a rally alive. Still, that's nothing compared to some other All-Star debuts. Babe Ruth might have hit the first All-Star homer, but the first All-Star run was surprisingly driven in by pitcher Lefty Gomez, who also won that inaugural game in 1933. Gomez went on to win a record three All-Star game and pitch in 18 All-Star innings, second only to Don Drysdale. By the way, Don Drysdale made his All-Star debut in 1959 and pitched three scoreless innings. As for hitters, there was Ken Boyer, who made his first All-Star appearance in 1956. Boyer went three for five and helped preserve a National League win with three excellent plays in the field. But the most successful All-Star debut probably belongs to Steve Garvey. In 1974, Garvey was a right-in starter at first base and he wound up winning the game's MVP award. Now, all of those players had one other thing in common besides starring in their first All-Star game. They all returned. Others, like Max West, didn't. In the 1940 game, West made the most of his only All-Star bat by hitting a three-run first-inning homer in the Nationals' 4 to nothing win. But the next inning, West ran into the wall and left the game, never to be an All-Star again. Then, there was a curious case of Dean Stone. Curious because Stone had entered the 1954 game just before Red Shaney's was thrown out, stealing home to end the eighth inning. The American League went on to win the game for Stone, who never actually retired a single batter. <laughs> like Stone and West before him, Lee Mazzilli also made the most of his one and only all-star appearance. The year was 1979. And the site, Seattle King Dome. That year, the Nationals came from behind to win 6-5. And the MVP was Pittsburgh's Dave Parker, who made two remarkable throws in back-to-back -back innings to keep the Nationals in the game. Line drive, right field. We may have a play at the plate. Big hop. Here comes Downing. Here's the throw. It is. He knocked him off the plate. What a tag by Carter. Oh, baby, what a play. Even with those two throws, Parker still might not have won the MVP award if New York Mets outfielder Lee Mazzilli hadn't come up big in his first all-star at bat. When I got into the situation where I had a pinch hit at that time, you know, I just went up there, just grabbed the bat and went up there and hit. I really didn't know what I was going to do, what I was trying to do. Uh, it just so happened that it worked out for the best. Well hit to left field, down the line. Nobody's going to get this one. It is a home run. Lee Mazzilli ties it up. Then from about second base to home plate, I kind of like floated around the bases. I don't think I even touched the ground. That's something that no one could ever take away from me for the rest of my life. There are not too many players in All-Star game history who just did what Mazzilli did. First All-Star at bat, and he hits a home run. But Mazzilli wasn't finished. One inning later in the top of the ninth, he came up with the bases loaded and worked out a walk which drove in the winning run. For Mazzilli, the whole All-Star experience will always be remembered. I think it's an honor. Watching these players pitch and play when uh, when I was growing up or playing in San Rafael, uh, you know, in my teens. And all of a sudden, there you are playing with them. Uh, and it's quite a feeling. It really is. I had retired eight straight men, and my parents were in the stands, and I knew that this is the only thing that separated me from three perfect innings. And I hadn't really gotten a good curveball over the plate, but I knew that if I could throw a curveball with two strikes to Bob Welch, I was going to strike him out, 
And I still remember seeing the pitch. I threw the good curveball. He swung and missed. And when I walked off the mound, I knew I could only pitch three innings. They couldn't get me anymore, and it was, uh, it was quite a moment. That moment, of course, took place during the 1980 All-Star Game at Dodger Stadium. Once again, the National League had a formidable lineup, and it was up to first-time All-Star Steve Stone to tame it. Stone was on his way to a Cy Young Award in 1980, relying on his curveball to go 12-3 and three at the break. But right from the opening batter, he knew this night would be different. Baby Lopes did not commit himself. None of his weight shifted forward. He kept his hands back, and he took my best curveball and, and hit a rope right down at Nettles, who made a great diving effort and threw him out. And I thought, it's a quarter to six. It's dusk. They can't see the ball very well, but everybody up there is looking breaking ball because that's my reputation. So I just went to the fastball, and as it turned out, in three innings, I threw 17 fastballs and seven curveballs, retired nine straight men, and it looked for a while like I was going to be named the most valuable player of the game, but Ken Griffey spoiled all that with a home run that once again led to a National League win. But even a National League win couldn't spoil Steve Stone's first and only taste of all-star play. For him, the moment lives on. One very special night in the life of a pitcher who simply had one very special year. When you have that opportunity, you know that fame is only borrowed, that it's going to be taken back by the great pitchers in the game. I was an average pitcher that happened to have a great year. I never deluded myself of that fact, and that was a highlight. So I knew that I was pretty happy and pretty lucky to get through it in that fashion. Every pitch that went to the plate, whether the guy took the pitch or whether he swung through it, I was moving one direction or another. And I remember still looking over uh, at Manny Trio, and he just looked at me and started laughing and shook his head. Maybe he had a flashback to his first All-Star game, I don't know, but I was very nervous, uh, very fidgety, very jumpy, and uh, I always remember that look from Manny Trio. Now, I bet you're thinking, getting started shouldn't be a problem for an all-star. But if you stop to think about it, it makes perfect sense. After all, come game time, there are a lot of eyes looking down at you. Not to mention all those peers you're trying to impress. But if a player does bomb out in his first all-star appearance, he wouldn't be alone. As things turned out for Joe DiMaggio, his first All-Star appearance was one he'd probably like to forget. That day, DiMaggio not only made an error which led to the National League's winning run, he also made the last out of the game and finished 0 for 5. DiMaggio went on to play in 11 All-Star games, one of the 29 players to appear in 10 or more. Of those 29, only a handful had hits in their first game. Their combined batting average, somewhere around 200. But at least they got another chance. What about those players who only got one? Like Adley Hammaker of the San Francisco Giants. In two-thirds of an inning, Hammaker gave up seven runs, including the first-ever All-Star Grand Slam to Fred Lynn, capping off what might have been the single worst debut in All-Star history. Hammaker might have gotten roughed up in his only All-Star appearance, but at least he didn't get hurt. Unfortunately, that was the case for Ray Fossey in the 1970 game. That year, the National League rallied to tie the game in the ninth and won it in the 12th on what is now considered the single most famous play in All-Star history. I was the type of player that liked the respect of my peers. And I know that as I was standing at home plate, one thing that was going through my mind was that I didn't want to give the Olay shot, the Matador, try to catch the ball, Olay, get out of the way, avoid getting hurt. I did start to slide. Uh, but he was up in front of the plate, up the line, blocking the plate. And I was watching the ball, concentrating on the ball. I had no idea where he was in running. I was reaching for the ball, and he hit me. I did start to slide, but he left me no recourse because there was no place to slide. Because if I slide, I'm not going to make the plate, and there's no sense in ever sliding into a bag 
if you can't get the bag. I, to this day, don't believe that he had any intention of wanting to run over me. Pete is just, that's his style, that was my style, and I just think it was two players in a particular style of play that collided. Uh, it seems that that play is going to go down as one of the top plays in All-Star history. Ironically, Fossey and Rose's meeting at home plate wasn't their first of the All-Star break. That took place the night before, thanks to pitcher Sam McDowell. Sam and I were talking, and he ran into Pete, introduced me to Pete, and Pete said, what are you doing after this function? I said, nothing. He said, well, we go to dinner. And so we had dinner, and the wives were talking, and Sam and Pete and I were talking, and, and when that was over, uh, Pete said, why don't you come back to the house? And they stayed in my house till about 3 o'clock in the morning, talking baseball at Pete's house. The next night, they didn't do much talking, but others will always talk about the play that made Ray Fossey's first and only all-star appearance a painful one. When they announced it, and I was at uh, the Tiger Stadium, and the people went nuts, and it was like, God, I made an accomplishment. You know, it was like a goal, which you figure I didn't start until May, and I was real hot. Was like, oh, wow all-star game. I mean, I used to only see the all-star game on TV. In 1976, Mark Fidrich didn't have to watch the all-star game on TV. He was in it, a real honest-to-goodness American folk hero known as much for his antics on the mound as for his 9-2 and record at the break. But on this night in Philadelphia, Fidrich's dream turned into a nightmare. Maybe my second time around, I've probably been more relaxed. My first time, I mean, I'm out to win. You see, a few guys came in the day of the game, you know, I'm there two days early, you know, and I'm just going, wow, you know, this is, this is unbelievable, this is awesome. Then you met the president, and I'm going, wow, I got to pitch a game, this is 10 minutes before the game, I got to meet the president, Jesus, this is blowing my game, you know, my game plan is like, get in front of my locker, you know, talk to myself, go over a few things, and here you got to shake the hands with the president, and then take off and go pitch, I'm going, Jesus, you know, I got to get myself together here, you know, it was weird, and then when you're, you're on a whole, totally different field, then you look up in the sky and you see all these people, 70,000 people, and all of a sudden you just see these guys on top of the roof like this with guns there because the president's there. I'm going, holy mackerel, some nut around here does something. These guys are going to open fire. Unfortunately for Mark, it was the National League which opened fire, scoring twice in the first to pin the loss on Fidrick in what turned out to be his only all-star appearance. <laughs> I remember that all-star game vividly, uh, obviously because it was my first, but uh, in that ball game, I batted against Catfish Hunter and drew a base on balls, and I batted against Raleigh Fingers and drew a base on balls. So I went uh, 0 for 0 with two walks, but it was quite a thrill. We took it right to the American League that year and kept our string alive. <laughs> When that is your very first All-Star game, you feel a little strange because there are veteran ball players that have been around 10, 12 years, some even longer than that. There are players that you idolized growing up. At first you have butterflies, but uh, once the game gets started, you sort of blend in as a group. And I got an opportunity to, to play the entire nine innings. Got my first hit, I think, my second half bat. Uh, stole a base. Uh, it was a thrill in itself. <laughs> 1987, making their first appearance in baseball's All-Star Game, were two youngsters who already had fulfilled their promise, Brent Saberhagen and Eric Davis. Davis gives it a ride again. Are you kidding me? That's his third home run of the day. Center field, it just keeps going. He caught it, he caught it, he caught it. Unbelievable. He goes. Pitch is high, the throw is late. Four stolen bases to go along. He hit it deep to left field. It's a slam. Eric Davis with a grand slam home run. Davis earned his all-star berth by hitting 19 homers by the end of May. The first time a National Leaguer had ever reached that mark so early in the season. Davis combines his tremendous power with excellent speed and defensive skill. In 1986, he gave National League opponents a fearsome look into the future by hitting 27 homers and stealing 80 bases, all in just 132 games. It's that rare combination of all-around ability that makes him one of the brightest young stars in the game. 
Faber Hagen's first All-Star invite came on the heels of a terrific start in 87 when he won 12 of his first 13 and was named Pitcher of the Month for April. Even though he was the American League Cy Young Award winner in 1985, he missed the All-Star game in 86, a season in which his pitching was disappointing. But the following year, he returned to the form he showed in leading the Royals to the World Championship in 1985, when he was named World Series Most Valuable Player. On the eve of their first All-Star appearance, Joe Morgan talked with Brent Faberhagen and Eric Davis. We're sitting here in the Oakland Coliseum where you guys will be playing the first of many All-Star games for you, I'm sure. Are you thinking about winning or just making an appearance? Whether you win or lose, I think the thing to go there and have a good time, enjoy yourself, meet some of the, the people that you see on TV all the time in the National League that you don't get a chance to talk to and you get a chance to meet them and uh, you know, kind of reminisce a little bit. Well, I'll tell you, experience. my first All-Star game, Chubb Feeney, who was the president, came in and he told us, you're not here to have fun, you're here to win. <laughs> so ours was a little different, my first one. But what are you thinking about, winning or just having a good time? Well, I, I'm like Brett, I'm thinking of just going in and having a good time because uh, when, when you go for the first time, it's a, it's a once in a lifetime dream. And from my standpoint, to be elected by the fans, it's, it's going to make it even a little bit better because it, it shows that the fans appreciate the way you play and they know it's a big feeling for me. And I'm just going out and, and have the best type of time that I can possibly have. Eric, you've been compared to the great Willie Mays. He played in 24 All-Star games. This is your first. You got a ways to go to catch up. I definitely have a long way to go. Uh, 24 All-Star games. I hope I play 24 years. <laughs> you know. But uh, you know, it's been it's been interesting for me because they've been comparing me to a lot of different people. First, it was Andre Dawson, then Bobby Bonds, and uh, they just jumped straight up to the Hall of Famers and, and Hank Aaron and Willie Mays. But I, I try not to worry about it and just go about my business day in and day out and just go out and do the best job that I can do. Brett, this is your first time on the All-Star team, but in 1985, you probably should have been on the team. You were 10-4 and four at the break. How disappointed were you at that particular time? Oh, I know Oil Cam Boys made, <laughs> made it quite a fuss a couple times, right. but uh, I knew I still had other shots to make it, and uh, I wasn't that well-known at the time, uh, coming off a 10-11 and 11 season in 84. So I really wasn't disappointed but as much as a few of the other players were that didn't make it. Uh, uh, it's one of those things where you just got to go out and try a little harder the next time out. Both of you have watched many All-Star games on television, I'm sure. Eric, what feat or what game stands out in your mind from watching all the All-Star games of the past? Well, I think the most interesting one that stands out in my mind is the one that they had in Dodger Stadium. James Rodney Richards was on the mound, and, I, and when they had that shadow that was just coming over home plate, and the guys didn't want to come to the plate because he was throwing so hard and he had his breaking ball. You know, we're breaking real sharp, and, and it seemed like the American League hitters didn't, didn't really want to come to the plate, and, and uh, that was a good feeling for me because the National League was, was doing real well. I'd like to put you in a hypothetical situation here. Say we're in the ninth inning, Eric Davis is at bat, base is loaded, 3-2 count, Brett Saberhagen is throwing. What are you going to throw him? I'm going to look over my shoulder and see if Dan's around it. <laughs> They're coming to put out the fire. <laughs> Fellas, we can talk about the All-Star game for the next few hours, and I don't think you'll really understand what the feeling is until they say, now starting in center field for the National League, Eric Davis, and on the mound for the American League is Brett Saberhagen. I think then you'll really feel and know what an All-Star game is all about. I'd like to say good luck to both of you, but really I'm a National Leaguer, so I have to pull up for him, Brett. But good luck. <laughs> Thanks for coming by. Thanks. Good luck, buddy. Good luck, Brett. Take care. All right. Well, I've always watched the All-Star game. I think it was a big part of the summer just to get back from the beach or whatever. And uh, I think it's a tribute to you personally and to all the players, and especially get to meet the players and play with them on that day. And especially you got all the United States watching and all over the world. You know, it's a great honor. Davis went 0 for 3. Saber Hagen pitched three scoreless innings for the American League. By the way, the National League won the game in 13 innings, 2 to nothing. I was lucky enough to broadcast many All-Star games, and I'll never forget my first one. It was in 1961 here at Fenway Park. Now, we had Mickey Mantle, Willie Mays, Hank Aaron, some of the greatest sluggers in the history of baseball coming in here, and everybody said it'll be a basketball score because of the famous left field wall, the green monster, and tiny Fenway Park where they run up some high scores. 
But when they came in here, the wind was blowing in off the Charles River against the hitters. The final score, one to one. The game was called at the end of nine innings because of rain. The only homer was hit by Rocky Calavito. The sluggers didn't slug. And after the game, the late Tom Yaffe, the owner of the Red Sox, said to me, Kurt, it just goes to show you that Fenway Park isn't that easy. For Joe Morgan, I'm Kurt Gowdy with Baseball's Greatest Hits.